Savior's precious name. It's really good to have you with us, and we trust that the Lord will bless us as we consider something of what He has done in our nation in the, in the past. Uh, we'll begin with, with a word of prayer, and, and as we, we pray tonight, uh, just a, some prayer requests just, just to bring before you. Um, jo- Joanne Elliott has asked us to pray for her wee granddaughter, Violet Grace, who has to go to the hospital for some scans, and she's asked us just to pray for Violet Grace and said that Amy would greatly appreciate that. So if you could in her prayers, please remember we Violet Grace. And if you could also, can I pray for the McClatchy's? Uh, Mr. McClatchy continues to be in hospital. And then those that mourn, remember the Andrews family circle as well. So let's just seek the Lord at the outset. Our gracious Father, we come into your holy presence in the name of our Savior. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for your love toward us. We thank you for Jesus Christ who died and rose again. And we praise you that tonight we are in your house. And we thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you and to praise you and to bring our thanks to you. Lord, we pray for those that particularly need our prayers at this time. We think of we violet grace. We commit this little one to you. You know the situation and we know the love that you have for the little ones. And we pray that your hand will be upon her and undertake for the whole family undertake for Amy, and we pray that you would just bless at this time. We pray for Mr. and Mrs. McClatchy. We commit them to you, and you know their need, and we pray that they will know your encouragement and know your touch at this time. We pray, Father, that you would undertake for our sister Ruth as she continues to mourn the loss of Leslie, and just bless the whole family, and we commit them all into your care, that they'll know the everlasting arms of the Savior to be round about them. For all others that cannot come out, all others that are laid aside, all others that are elderly and infirm. You know which one? And we know that there is no need that is not hidden from you. We pray that you be with us tonight as we consider this particular subject and think of your overruling providence in our nation in the past and how truth vanquished evil. And this should encourage our hearts, and we pray that we'll do so. And so we pray that you be with us now. May we know your presence and know your help. In the Savior's name, we ask all of these things. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight, at this season of the year, I thought that we would think about King William III and Mary II. Their story is a story of family rivalry. It's a story of dramatic revolution. It's a story of war and bloodshed. It's a story when Europe was an absolute upheaval, and when Britain was changed forever for the good. But it is also a love story. It's a story of two young people who were married, and God really blessed their marriage for good, because they put God first. And as a result of their marriage, the history of a nation was changed. And there is much talk, isn't there, about King, King William, the Prince of Orange, and we remember him. But we should remember his wife as well, because after all, they were joint heads of state, and they are the only joint monarchs in the history of our nation. And he would not have been the king that he was without his wife by his side. And that is something that is well worth remembering as we think about this story. In the first place, we're going to read from the Scriptures, and we're going to turn to the the Psalm 118. The Psalm 118. I have selected this psalm because the Prince of Orange had a Scottish chaplain. Whenever he first arrived in England to take the crown in November 1688, he had Dutch soldiers, but he also had regiments from both England and Scotland with him. It wasn't the case of a foreigner bringing a foreign army. There was very much a homegrown British army there to support him. 
and they had chaplains. So there was a Scottish chaplain, and he would have been a Presbyterian. And whenever that great fleet docked at Torbay in Devon, the chaplain said to the king, he said, let us sing. And they sang the Psalm 118 as they stepped foot upon English soil. So let's just read the, the opening verses of this psalm, and I think you will see how appropriate they are. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. And the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do unto me. The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compassed me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They compassed me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Amen. And we know that God will bless the reading of his word to our hearts. I think we can see the relevance of the Psalm 118 to the life that the Prince of Orange lived. It was a life of warfare. It was a life of soldiering. It was a life of strife. It was a life of great difficulty. But at all times, he was aware that the Lord was on his side. And that was very, very important to him as a Calvinist. And we'll come to that in a few minutes. But I think as Presbyterians, it should be of interest that whenever they stepped foot in, in Brixham in Torbay, it was a Presbyterian chaplain that said, let's sing the psalm. And it just shows you the influence that our Presbyterian fathers had upon the Prince of Orange. There is no doubt about it, but William and Mary together, they made modern Britain. Modern Britain would not be the nation that it is today without this king and queen. A little book called William III, Mary II, Partners in Revolution by Jonathan Keats. He said this, the kingdom of 1702, that was the year the Prince of Orange died, looks significantly different from the one they had jointly taken over a mere 14 years previously. By the end of the reign, Britain had assumed the outlines of that modern society based on liberty, property, and legitimate aspiration, which has since been adopted throughout the world. It certainly would not have been achieved without them. And that is high commendation indeed. And I think as we work our way through this talk tonight, we will come to understand that that these great things that we prize, liberty, equality, freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of parliament, all of these things came straight out of the Protestant Reformation. And there is so much about our country today that can be traced directly back to what is known as the Williamite Settlement of 1688. And so we come to look at the couple who really help to make modern Britain. And yet, historically, they are not trumpeted as much as they ought to be, and that is probably because of their staunch and uncompromising Protestantism. Let's now take a step back. Let's 
trace the, the background of William and Mary before they were married. So let's begin with Mary, first of all. Or let's begin with William, first of all. William was born in the United Provinces of the Netherlands, in The Hague, on the 4th of November, 1650. Now, he was known as the Prince of Orange. And the reason why he was known as the Prince of Orange because his family inherited an estate. He was known as a principality within France. It was a landlocked principality in southern France. And there still is a town today in southern France called Orange. And so the Prince of Orange, the name Orange is French, comes from that area of France. And the family originally, they were not French and they were not Dutch. They were actually German. And so how is it that a German family with a, a French principality came to be so associated with Holland, with the Netherlands. Well, in order to understand that, we have to come all the way back to William's great-grandfather. And William's great-grandfather was William I of the Netherlands, and his name is William the Silent. Now, in those days, it was quite common to to use adjectives to describe leaders and to set them apart from other leaders. It was a rather strange title, isn't it, William the Silent? It doesn't mean he was a, a quiet man, but it, it meant that at important times he knew when to keep silence, and of course that's a very important thing. And there we have his statue in The Hague. He is known as the father of the Dutch Republic. Now, William the Silent, the Prince of Orange that we're studying, his uh, was, was William's great-grandfather. He was German. And he was an important courtier for the most important man in the world in the middle of the 1500s. He was an important courtier for Charles V. And Charles V was the emperor of Spain, and he was also the Holy Roman Emperor. That basically meant he governed the most of Germany. And so Charles V was a, a powerful man. So amongst his territories was Germany, amongst his territories was Austria, amongst his territories was Spain, and all of the overseas colonies that Spain was developing, great empire, and the Netherlands were part of his, uh, part of his territories. Now, Charles V, he hated Protestants, it was Charles V that Luther stood before and said at Worms, here I stand, I could do none other, God helping me. And because Charles V had given Luther a promise, Luther was not put to death. But he often regretted the fact that he did not burn Luther to death. And he hated Protestants. And the Dutch people became Lutheran. The Dutch people had a great affinity for for Protestantism as it was developing, and Charles V couldn't abide that. So, in conjunction with the papacy, he created something that has become infamous. It was known as the Spanish Inquisition, and the Spanish Inquisition martyred tens of thousands of Protestants in the Netherlands. It was a horrific thing, and, and the the, the manner of the sufferings and the manner of the cruelty that Protestants endured in the Netherlands during those years was totally horrific. And William the Silent at that stage, he, he was a Roman Catholic. He was not a Lutheran. But he watched all of this and he saw it unfold. And then Charles V, he abdicated. And whenever he abdicated in 1555, he said something rather insightful. He was a clock collector. And he says, I I'm a fool, he said. I, I can't make two of my clocks go at the same time. How can I possibly make men think alike where religion is concerned? But it was all too late for the Dutch Protestants. Charles V was succeeded by his son, Philip II. Philip II never ruled Germany. 
but he did rule Spain, and he did rule the Netherlands, and he did rule Austria, and it was Philip II who sent the great Spanish Armada to England to try to conquer England, but of course he failed in that. And Philip II, from the year 1566, he made another attempt to crush the Protestant faith in the Netherlands, and he reinvoked the Spanish Inquisition. But by this time, William the Silent was a Lutheran, and then he would later become a Calvinist. And it was at this time William the Silent attempted to prevent another tragedy. And so he moved to the Netherlands, and he took control of the, the, the Dutch people and their armed forces, and he organized an insurgence against the might of the, the great Spanish Empire. And the insurgents went on for years and years, and the Spanish Empire put a bounty on the head of William the Silent. And eventually, in 1584, William the Silent was assassinated. And it is said that little children on the streets of Holland, they wept whenever they heard that their great champion was dead. But he had done his work. And eventually, the area of the Netherlands that became known as the United Provinces was born as a republic. And the reason why the Netherlands became independent was because of Protestantism. It was because of their love and their desire for freedom to worship. They gave them the desire, the fight, the stomach, to strive for their independence. And they won it. So this was the proud tradition into which the Prince of Orange was born. Now, William III, the Prince of Orange, was the son of William II. He was known as the Stadtholder of the Dutch Republic, and William's mother was Princess Mary. Now, the Dutch Republic was a very complicated place, and we don't need to understand very much about the complexities of it, but the very term United Provinces would tell us there was different provinces. And there were, there were different in terms of their outlook, in terms of their leadership. And it was very difficult to hold them together. So they were all Protestants. They all had their own ideas and their own thinking and their own politics. And the Stadtholder wasn't really a king, but it was a republic. But he was like a president, like an overall leader. But William II, William's father, had great difficulty keeping the whole thing together. And eventually there was a civil war. In the midst of that civil war, he took smallpox and he died a very young man. And the Prince of Orange, or William III, was only just a few months old when his father sadly passed away. Whenever his father passed away, in the midst of a political upheaval, the role of stadtholder also passed away. But because the House of Orange was the wealthiest family within the Netherlands and a very important family, the Dutch Republic seized the young Prince of Orange from his mother, and they undertook to bring him up and to raise him as a ward of state. Now, in the future, this young man who was a ward of state would need lots of political cunning and courage to lead the Netherlands. And he would need all of that cunning and political courage to be the greatest Protestant leader in Europe. So even as we look at the background and his father's untimely death, we can see something of God's providence in raising this young man through a very difficult background to be a great Protestant champion in Europe. God makes no mistakes. Now, let us think a little bit about William's royal pedigree and his connections with England. Now, his mother was Mary Stuart. Now, that means she was both Scottish and English. She was British. There were lots of Marys in British history. It's important to separate them all out. So you have Mary, Queen of Scots, who was the young Scottish Roman Catholic queen. And she too was Mary Stuart. And there was Mary Tudor, the English queen who killed all the Protestants in England. 
And she, she was a different Mary. And so there are several Marys in, 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 our, our, in the history of our nation, and, and, and you need to keep them separate. But this woman, who actually was the first one in England to hold the title Princess Royal, she was the daughter of King Charles I. So that means that William Prince of Orange, on his mother's side, was the grandson of King Charles I. And he was the great-grandson of King James the first. So, William Prince of Orange himself belonged to the British royal household. So, he not only had European blood, the blood of the Netherlands, the blood of Germany, the blood of France, the, he also had the blood of England, the blood of Scotland flowing through his veins. And he was also the nephew of King Charles the second, and King Charles the second was Mary Stuart's brother. So he was closely and intimately connected with England. Now, what about his upbringing? So we know his father died when he was very young. And his, his mother died, actually, when he was only 10 years of age. But he never really had a close relationship with his mother. Uh, but she died in 1560. Um... He suffered from a curved spine when he was very young. And it is said that they had to get a really tight corset to put it around him. And it was often said that he had a hunch back, although the degree of the hunch was probably greatly exaggerated at the time. He suffered from asthma when he was very young. And he suffered from asthma throughout his entire life. And actually, it was a chest infection that killed him at the last, and that was probably connected with his asthma. He always had a very poor appetite from a child and right through his whole life. You know, whenever you look at his poor health in an age when so many people died young and so many people died in childhood, he was the most unlikely person imaginable to be a great warrior king, and he was a great warrior king. Remarkable thing. From age five, he was educated by a man called Cornelius Trigland. Now, Cornelius Trigland was a Dutch Reformed minister. He was a member of the Synod of Dort. The Synod of Dort was the Scottish Synod that defined what Calvinism was, because there was this great upheaval within the Dutch church. You had this guy called Arminius, Jacobus Arminius, and, and he started to question some of the things that Calvin had been teaching, and it caused a whole upheaval, and eventually it meant that Arminius was cast out, excommunicated. All his supporters were excommunicated from the Dutch Reformed Church. And there were no people in Europe as finely tuned to Calvinistic theology as the Dutch people as a result of all of that. And for the Dutch people, Calvinism, well, it was about a God who predestines all things, a God who's in charge, a God who makes no mistakes, a God who's controlling all events that takes place in the history of the world, a God who has a very important plan for us, and he has predestined that plan that he has for us. A God who sees us as depraved and warped sinners. We can do nothing good, and we can be saved only by His grace. I'm sure you've heard of the term tulip, the acrostic, to define what Calvinism is, and that, that really came from the Synod of Dort, and the tulip, of course, has connections with, with, with Holland. So, the, the Netherlands ha had a huge part to play in defining Reformed theology. And so, William was steeped in all of this, and the doctrine of predestination particularly would be an anchor that would keep him in the midst of a very turbulent life. A turbulent life he would have from the year 1572, when he was 22 years of age. England had an agreement with both the Netherlands and Sweden that they would defend each other's interests because they were three Protestant countries. But Charles II was greatly attracted by the ambitions of Louis XIV, the great French king. And Louis XIV wanted to seize as much territory as he could in Europe, and he had the money, he had the finances, he had the backing. And 
Charles II agreed to take some of Louis XIV's money and wealth, and he became virtually a vassal king to Louis XIV. And as a result of that, he reneged on his understanding with the Netherlands, and he agreed to go to war against the Netherlands, and he would support Louis XIV. And so in 1572, there was an Anglo-French alliance which declared war on the Netherlands, and they wanted really to steal the independence of the Protestant Netherlands. And it, it was a great crisis. It was a crisis that would define William's life forever. The English Navy bombarded the shore of the Netherlands, and the French army overran the Netherlands, 150,000 soldiers, an enormous army, overran the Netherlands. And at this hour of crisis, the Netherlands once again looked to the House of Orange for support. And William became the commander of the land and naval forces of the Netherlands. He didn't just become the commander, but he became triumphant. The English were the first to withdraw. And then later in 1574, Louis XIV withdrew. And the independence of the people of the Netherlands was preserved. And just to complicate things a little further, the English king who attacked the Netherlands was actually William's uncle. And so that was the moment whenever William became the foremost Protestant leader in Europe because he triumphed over both England and France and it was a kind of a David versus Goliath struggle, but God certainly was on the side of the Netherlands on that particular occasion. And so that's William's background, and that was his life that brought him to the place that he became this great leader. Now let's think about Mary, Princess Mary. She was somewhat younger, 12 years younger than William. She was born the 30th of April, 1662, a daughter of James Stuart, Duke of York, and High Duchess of York. When we look at that picture there, you see James Stuart and his wife. His wife died when the children were relatively young, something that Mary had in common with uh, her future husband, William. But there are three monarchs of England in that picture. James the Stuart became James the Second. His daughter, Mary, became Mary II, and his daughter, Anne, became Queen Anne. And Queen Anne, of course, became the first queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, the United Kingdom of both England and Scotland. So it's quite a significant portrait, that. And James II, of course, would be the last Roman Catholic monarch of these islands. Now, it is a most remarkable thing that, that Mary, Mary ever had strong Protestant faith. Her father was a deeply immoral man to begin with, a deeply immoral man. In fact, it is reckoned that altogether he fathered 27 children. Um, 20 children to his two wives. Now, very few of them survived. In fact, of the later Stuarts, their health was so terrible that many of the children, they, they died so very young and they suffered from all kinds of ailments. But he also fathered seven illegitimate children as well. And actually, his wife and him were married whenever she was expecting their first child. And that, of course, was Queen Mary. But that didn't rule her out of the succession. But it caused a bit of a scandal at the time. So not only was he a deeply immoral man, as was his brother Charles II, he was also a Roman Catholic. So he converted to Roman Catholicism. And because he converted to Roman Catholicism, Charles II did something. He took the two girls, Mary and Anne, away from their father and mother. And he said, they will be wards of state, just like William was. And although... Charles wasn't a particularly good man either. It is rumored that he converted to Catholicism before he died. 
But he recognized the real upset it would cause in the nation for his brother to become a Roman Catholic king. And particularly if the two girls would be brought up as Roman Catholics. And so he insisted that the two girls would be brought up as Protestants. And Mary and Anne were exposed to the teaching of Henry Compton, Bishop of London. Now, Henry Compton was renowned for his strong Protestant views. And he became Mary's spiritual mentor. And it was through his ministry that Mary developed strong Protestant opinions, just like her future husband across the North Sea. And not only that, but he became... Uh, but but she, she became a very devout and saintly Christian. So at the old Richmond Palace, which isn't there anymore, they were placed into the charge of the Villiers family. And there they were raised. But they continued to have a relationship with their father down through uh, the years. Now we come to the year 1677, a most significant year, a royal wedding. It wasn't really a very romantic kind of a marriage. It was suggested to William, look, it's about time you were taking a wife. Why don't you take an English wife? And there's your cousin, Princess Mary. And she's a Protestant. Why didn't you think about marrying her? And he thought, well, that perhaps could be a good idea because I've defeated the English in battle and it would be good for the Netherlands if I could develop an alliance with the English. And so I'll sail across and I'll I meet the king. It, it wasn't the father he would go to, it would be the king. The, the king would have the final say. And so I met Charles II, and Charles II was amenable to the idea because he had suffered a bit of a humiliation at the hands of the Dutch, and he could see some mileage in having some alliance with the Netherlands for the future, and so poor Mary became caught up in the midst of all of this. Um, James, her father, wasn't really very on for it because... William was such a Protestant, but he had no say. And it was he who went to his daughter and he broke the news to the 15-year-old girl and he said, you're going to be married to William, the Prince of Orange. And they said that she cried because she knew she'd be leaving England, leaving home. But William did something that was rather unusual. He said to Charles II that he would agree to the marriage on the condition that he would meet the girl first. And so they met each other before they were married. And he had the final decision. And he was happy with the meeting. And so the two were married. Now, the future of England would rest upon this marriage. The future of Protestantism in Europe would rest upon these marriage. The future of for Protestantism here in Ireland would rest upon this marriage. So, although it wasn't a very romantic beginning, the outcoming of this marriage was quite profound. And they did grow to love each other deeply. There's no doubt about that. Louis XIV despaired whenever he heard of it. He said that the Duke, that is James II, has given his daughter to the greatest enemy that he had in the whole, in the entire world. And so, William and Mary, they set sail for um, the Netherlands. Now, William was really glad to say farewell to England. He hated the English court. It was so sordid. It was so immoral. It was so wicked. It was so vile. He, he couldn't abide it. He was so glad to say farewell to, the, to, to, to England. And, and Mary, she came to love the Netherlands. She loved the cleanliness of the Netherlands, the cleanliness of the people, the hygiene of the people. We'll come, we'll think about that. And, and they loved her. And they loved her ways and they loved her manners. And she became really, really popular. But it was a marriage beset by problems, many problems. She was greatly disappointed by the fact that she could not bear her son a child. She had two miscarriages and she never had children and that was always something that she bore until the day that she died. Another more serious problem was the work of the enemy. There was slander put about constantly that William 
had a mistress, one of her ladies in waiting, somebody called Elizabeth Villiers, whom she had known throughout her life. And this slander is still perpetuated to the present day. There's very little proof for it, actually. It's all hearsay. We know ever so much about the mistress of some of these other kings, but there, there's so little evidence that William the third actually behaved in that way. And actually, he bore, he, he had no illegitimate children. Elizabeth Villiers went on to be married and have children, but certainly no children to the king. And so there was no evidence. It was just all hearsay and, and slander. And then there was an even greater, more wicked slander where it was put about. And again, this story continues to be perpetuated at times, and there's absolutely no evidence for it, that William actually became a homosexual. And that was why they had no children. And one of the reasons for this was the fact that he had a number of loyal male friends, and he had them throughout his life. But all men have friends, and close friends, and very often lifelong friends. And it, it just seemed that if, if the evidence that, if, if they couldn't get the news to stick that, that, that William was an adulterer with a woman, they, they tried to put out this story that, that he was a homosexual, but, but there was absolutely no evidence for it. And William knew about all of these rumors, and he was never fazed by it. And again, that is pretty much evidence that, that it actually wasn't true, and he knew himself that it wasn't true. And it all has the hallmarks of Jesuitical cunning to destroy the reputation of the great Protestant leader. Another challenge came from her father, James. He wanted uh, Mary to become a Roman Catholic. He would write to her. He would send messages to her. He would send theological arguments to her. And so he would bombard her with Roman Catholicism, but she would never budge. And then there was Louis XIV. He never again tried to invade the Netherlands, but he did invade the Spanish Netherlands to the south, and he caused problems there. And William was constantly worried that his nation could be left exposed once again. But with all of these problems came opportunities. 1685 came. Louis XIV drove all of the Protestants out of France, the Huguenots. 400,000 Protestants had to leave France. That actually helped William's Protestant armies. And James II became king of England. And he started to make moves to make England a Roman Catholic country. He filled the, the, the army with, with Roman Catholic officers. He seized control of, of, of the army in England. And that was causing problems in Parliament. He tried to bring in an indulgence where dissenters, Protestant dissenters and Roman Catholics would have equal freedom. But that was greatly uh, held in suspicion by many Protestants because they saw it as a way to put Roman Catholicism once again in the ascendancy. And as a result, seven bishops within the Church of England, they were thrown into the Tower of London because they refused to acquiesce with what the king was doing. But they were acquitted by the law courts. And as a consequence of that, seven leading men in the country, including Bishop Compton, Mary's old friend, they became known as the Immortal Seven. They sent a letter to William, Prince of Orange, and they said, please come and be our king. And William was placed in a position where he had no option but to act. He had to do something. He couldn't stay in the Netherlands. England was in upheaval, constitutional crisis. Roman Catholicism was overrunning the country. And there seemed to be a constitutional way for him and Mary to become king and queen. And so he prepared his great invasion force. Now, there was something else that happened that was really significant. James II had a young wife. And after not being able to produce a male heir, and after so many of his children dying in infancy, she gave birth to a son. And it became a, a great, what you would call, a conspiracy theory that it wasn't really his son. Some historians today cast doubt upon whether the son was actually James' son or not. Nevertheless, a son was born, and the prospect of a Roman Catholic succession became too much for the people to bear. And so, on the back 
of all of that, William prepared to come to England with a vast force, 600 ships, 19,000 soldiers. But actually, 19,000 soldiers to, to take a country the size of England, it was actually a very small force. And we, we get a sense of the deep love that Mary and William had for each other when he prepared to leave. Because her, her journal, we still have her journal, she, she said that William spoke to her weeping. And he said that if anything happened to him, if this didn't work, he said he would, uh, she, she could marry again. Uh, but the, the, the only condition, he said, please don't marry a papist. And she wrote, he himself could not pronounce these words without shedding tears, and without the interview he showed me all the tenderness I could desire, so much indeed that I shall never in my life forget it. My distress confused me, but I assured him that I could never love anyone else, for assuredly I could never find his like. He answered me with so much tenderness as to increase my love for him, if that were possible. And so he left. James's navy was was on the channel, but he managed to outfox James's navy. The wind initially drove them back to the Netherlands, and they prayed, and God sent a wind that became known as the Protestant wind that took them right along the English Channel and brought them into Devon, to the wet. And they landed, and there was no battle, and there was no bloodshed, there was no army to meet them, and England rallied to his banner, the Princess Anne, she rallied to the banner as well. Uh, a man called Churchill, who was one of James's leading generals, come over to William, and James eventually realized there was no crown to fight for. And he virtually abdicated. He did what they called, he unkinged himself. And he fled to France. And as a result, William and Mary were crowned jointly as king and queen on the 11th of April, 1689. However, it's, it's quite interesting. It, 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 it wasn't actually a done deal from the outset. Uh, William was always insistent that he would accept nothing less than being king. And Mary insisted that if she was queen, her husband would always have to be king. And the reason why she said that was because the scriptures teach that the, the husband is the head of the wife, and how could she obey God's word and be a queen if her husband was not a king? And, and so her views were actually really important in all of that. And the English parliament realized that they needed this Dutch prince. They could not be without him at this hour of crisis. And so they became king and queen. But after the very grand ceremony, and we've seen something of the grandeur of a coronation, apparently they were quite relieved to have it behind them. It is said that William referred to it as those old popish ceremonies. And Mary recorded that it was all just vanity, all of the pomp and the show. And perhaps William, as he took loyalty from some of those nobles who came and swore loyalty to him. The very same men had sworn loyalty just five years earlier to James II. And so he knew that all of these things can be so fickle. For them to take the crown, however, was not without preconditions. There had to be a Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights underpins our parliamentary democracy today. There had to be free parliament. The king just couldn't just call a parliament at a whim and dismiss a parliament. Parliament had to be free. You had to have freedom of speech. You had to be freedom of the press. You had to have a right to trial by jury. You couldn't interfere with the courts. All of these things were so important. You know, 100 years later, the French would have a very bloody revolution. And they would talk about liberty, equality, fraternity. All of these concepts were embedded into the glorious revolution of 1688, and it all rose straight out of the Protestant Reformation and the Reformation's idea that men and women are equal under God, 
And all of that really was very important. William only spent one full year in Britain. Only one full year. He spent so much of the time in Europe, so much of the time fighting Louis XIV. And so in 1690, he had to, to head to the River Boyne. Uh, the Duke of Schomburg had made a rather poor show of trying to get rid of uh, James and his armies that were occupying all of Ireland apart from Ulster. And so William went personally to the Boyne and he fought James. It took Mary, I think, four or five days before she actually heard the news. And she was praying. It was as well as she was praying because the king got shot the night before the battle. But the battle was won. But this was a woman who did love her father. And the thought of her husband and her father both staring across that river at one another, forces killing each other. She found that an impossible strain. In fact, she was so relieved when she heard that both her father and her husband were safe. And of course, her father, to the disgust of the Irish, ran away. And the, the burden that she felt, having taken her father's crown, and she knew it had to happen, and she knew there was no other way, but yet she always carried a certain sense of guilt until the day she died that she had done such a thing. So there was a story of a fractured family in the midst of all of that that we should never, ever forget. Now let's think about this couple in a very personal way. We talked about the cleanliness. We'll, we'll deal with that first. I think it's rather amusing. The, the Dutch were a very clean people. The Hague was one of the cleanest cities in Europe, apparently. The English were anything but clean. In fact, it is said that an English ambassador once came to visit the prince and princess of Orange in the Netherlands. And the English ambassador was sitting at the dining table and he spat on the floor, which is normal behavior for him. A servant came quickly and cleaned it up. He couldn't believe it, that the people were so clean. And whenever William and Mary came to England, it is believed that they passed on some of that hygiene, that spirit of cleanliness, and it did have a positive impact upon the manners of the English. Gardening, they loved and they delighted to garden. And Kensington particularly was, was what they developed. Uh, they purchased a site at Kensington because Whitehall was, was so unhealthy. It was, it, it, it was full of smog and smoke and it wasn't good for the king's asthma. So they purchased a site at Kensington. They built the Red Brick Palace and it created a fashion for red brick housing. And they developed the gardens. And it is believed that they helped to create a fashion for building red brick houses in England at that time. Time. Now, William, after the Boyne, he spent ever so much time away. He spent months every year in Europe fighting Louis XIV. And the English Parliament would support him and give him money to uh, build his armies and to fight Louis XIV. He said, We have to restrain Louis XIV for the sake of peace in Europe. And he was very insistent on all of that. And whenever he was away, she was very much the queen, taking all of the major decisions, running the affairs of state. Now, she was greatly loved as a queen. She was different from him. He was rather dour, rather aloof, stood back a little from the people. His manners weren't that friendly. It was his Dutch uh, attitude, really, his Dutch culture. But, but she was different. Uh, at five foot 11, she must have looked such a striking figure as she went amongst the people. He was only five foot six. And she w got involved in charitable work. She got involved amongst the people. She was loved by the people. But it is said as well that she would have been perfectly at home in Cromwell's Puritan Commonwealth because she had really strict views about keeping the Sabbath day. I just want to read this to you. Uh, I'm going to send all of this out to you, and I have all of this written, and you can read it later. I think this is really interesting. In William's absence, and with the wholehearted support of John Tillotson, 
the recently appointed Archbishop of Canterbury, Queen Mary issued royal proclamations for the more reverent observation of the Sabbath and against swearing and profanity. She sent directives to magistrates throughout the country to use particular severity with regard to drunkenness and had circular letters urging the general reform of manners read from pulpits everywhere. It included several puritanical regulations for observing the Sabbath in London, including an order that hackney coaches could not drive that day, that constables had to take, I smile at this, had to take away pies and puddings from anybody they met carrying them in the streets. She was determined the royal household should also uphold the example. Her officers of guards were told that they could they should strictly enjoin all the soldiers under them to refrain from swearing and drunkenness, that it was their duty to attend divine service every Sunday. It is said she was a queen who, she was known to pray every day, twice a day. People knew she prayed, she had her devotion to the Lord. She certainly led by example. Um, between the two of them, they were great philanthropists. For example, she took great pride in building a new hospital for injured seamen and sailors at Greenwich. And Christopher Wren did the architecture. And she also established a college founded by Royal Charter in Virginia to give English settlers educational opportunities. And that became known as the William and Mary College. However, her relationship with her sister didn't exactly develop very well after she became queen. The two sisters didn't really get on, didn't correspond much. There was differences between them. However, Anne had a son also called William. And the difference between the sisters didn't affect their attitude to William. William and Mary, they looked on little William as if he was their own son. And there's wonderful, touching stories of of their, of, of their love and of the time that they spent with this little boy. Of course, he would be the future king, but he wasn't because he died so very young, like so many of the stewards. But he wasn't the only one to die young. Mary, she died very suddenly in 1694, just after Christmas. Just before Christmas, she saw spots. She realized it was smallpox. Smallpox was one of the greatest contagions known to humanity. Millions and millions of people throughout the world in history have died of smallpox. And she wasn't the only monarch to die of smallpox. And William's father, if you remember, died of smallpox before. And whenever she realized she was taking this contagion, she very quickly uh, gathered together all of her private papers and what she didn't want preserved, she had destroyed. She told the Archbishop of Canterbury that she had nothing then to do but to look up to God and submit to his will. And the country was plunged into deep mourning when the news went out that the young queen was dead, only 34 years of age. The king himself was plunged into awful grief. People thought he would never get over it, and I don't think he ever did. I am now the most miserable creature upon earth. I have never known one single fault in her, he said. She was given a, a wonderful funeral. All of Parliament was present. I said it was the first royal funeral where all of Parliament were present. Crowds lined the streets, her coffin was drawn in a gun carriage, crown and scepter carried in the cushion. The cannon was fired every minute the cortege took to reach Westminster Abbey. And yet after she died, they found a letter that she only wanted a very private funeral. But that was too late. They had already given her the public funeral. William served for several years more. In the year 1701, he made his final speech to Parliament. He said at that speech, if you do in good earnest desire to see England hold the balance of Europe and to be indeed at the head of the Protestant interest, lay aside those fatal animosities which divide and weaken you. I think there's something very significant about that speech. He believed in the United Kingdom. He believed in the kingdoms coming together 
as one kingdom. But it was opposed at that time, and so it was never carried through. It would be carried through during the reign of Queen Anne. But he realized that England would be stronger with Scotland together and with Ireland as well as one kingdom. He was a man of tremendous foresight. Something else he achieved, however, before he died, he achieved victory over Louis. Although his soldiers could not ever triumph over the French in battlefield, he forced Louis to the negotiating table. And he forced Louis to withdraw from all the territories that he had seized since 1677. That was a humiliation for Louis the Fourteenth. Daniel Defoe, very famous figure in uh, literature, he said this about King William. Now, King William had his critics within the nation, particularly amongst the aristocracy and amongst the parliamentarians. He had his critics. He was so often away from home. But Daniel Defoe wrote this. He has fought for you, fatigued and harassed this person, robbed himself of all his peace for you. He has been in a constant hurry, run through a million hazards for you, tired with serving an unthankful nation, absolutely broke his heart, for which reason I think him as much murdered as his predecessor was, whose head was cut off by his subjects. And so he had very strong words. But that actually highlights the fact that within the nation, there were still those who had a great love for the prince of Orange. He died on the 8th of March, 1702. He was out hunting in, in, uh, at, at Hampden Court, and he, he loved to hunt. Even though his health wasn't the best, he, he still got out on the horse. It was his hobby. It was his passion. It, it was what he loved to do. And the, the horse stumbled on a molehill, and as the horse went down on its knees, he came off and he fractured his shoulder, something that should not have been life-threatening. But he returned to Kensington and an infection set in and eventually it became a lung infection and he, he couldn't fight it off. And so he slipped out of this world into eternity. But whenever he died, they discovered that he had a black thread around his neck. On that black thread, there was a little ring that belonged to Princess or Queen, Queen, Queen Mary. But he had that little ring made into a little locket. And inside that little locket, there was a, a strand of her hair. Over all those years, he had kept that close to his heart. He used to tell him, you know, go and get yourself a younger wife. It is your duty as a king to produce an heir. But he would never do it because in his heart he still loved his queen. And so it is a love story. I was greatly enraged, you know, whenever I read the, what Westminster Abbey has to say about King William. And it's on the website. Just, you know, all the tombs are in Westminster Abbey, the tombs of all of these kings and queens. And so they have stuff on the web that interprets the lives of these kings and queens. And of King William, it said he was never popular. It said he just became king because uh, to, to, to stop a Roman Catholic prince becoming king. And it is, it's utter rubbish. Uh, you know, it, it was all about the liberty. It was all about the freedom. And, and it was, things that are so precious today came into being because of this king. And yet, even today, Popery has managed to desecrate his memory. And I think it's shocking the way all of that has happened. He was the king who prayed. The king who prayed. The Reverend Ron Johnson shared something with me that was published by the Orange Order, I think, back in 1690. It was an article called The Prayers of King William III. And... All of those prayers are amazing and wonderful. And by the way, the, 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 the coin there, that, that must be a very rare coin because there you see two heads of state in the one coin. And only one time in history that has ever happened. But I was struck by this prayer and, and, and we'll finish with this. 
I thine, I thine unworthy servant desire likewise humbly to intercede with thee, the God and Father of all, for all mankind, that thou wouldest be pleased to have compassion upon their blindness and ignorance, their gross errors and their wicked practices. Send forth, I beseech thee, thy light and thy truth to scatter that thick darkness which covers the nations and overspread so great a part of the world that it may be known upon earth and thy saving health among all nations. A prayer for all nations of the world. I think all people can look back with a sense of pride to the reign of this man. He was a great believer in religious liberty for all. That's the way it was in the Netherlands. Roman Catholics had equal freedom with Protestants in the Netherlands. And whenever he came to Ireland, for example, he told the Irish Protestants to treat the Irish Roman Catholics with great respect. And they didn't do that. And that's why we have so many problems today. It doesn't go back to the Boyne or to Cromwell or to the plantation. It goes back to the way the, the, the Irish Protestants treated the Roman Catholics. But that's, that's another story. They certainly didn't listen to King William. King William, as well, in, in England, um, he, he wanted Roman Catholics to be given equal freedoms as well. And he could see that that was the future. That was where the future was going. But again, they didn't do that at that time, although eventually they did. So he's a man with great foresight. It is said at the Battle of the Boyne, I think this is, is a wonderful way just to finish. It said at the Battle of the Boyne that you had the, the future and the past. King James was the past. A king who believed he could act as God, do what he wanted. And a king who believed in the freedom of the people. And one had his opinions very much based upon this book. And the other had his opinions very based, very much based upon the example of the papacy. And King William was the man of the future. But he was the man of the book. And of course our country needs to get back to the book. And how vital that is. But in a time of great darkness, when all, it seemed that the future of Protestantism had hung in the balance in Europe, God worked and he can do so again. And I think we should encourage our hearts by that thought. Let's just bow in prayer. Oh God, our Father, we thank you for your hand upon our nation in days gone past. We thank you for raising up a Protestant king and a Protestant queen who made such a difference and for those who supported them and for the victories that they gained. And we know this was of the Lord's doing. It was marvelous in our eyes. And we thank you for the great and goodly heritage that we have today as a consequence of what they did. And we can even see the the glimmers of light shining from the past into the present, even in this dark time. And we pray earnestly that the light would shine again, that God would come again and revive his work, and that a fear of God would come upon our nation as it did in the past. Lord, we pray that you would part us from this place now with your blessing. Keep your hand upon us through the remainder of the week. Bless us as we come to your house on the Lord's day, that we will hear your voice that we will know your spirit. And for Christ's sake, amen. Amen. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. Th th thank you.